no blue. There is. Excellent. Here we go. I guess excellent. I'll continue here. <laughs> uh, yeah, excellent. Cool. Okay, so we'll, we'll kick things off then. So, um, yeah, like, like you know, I'm I'm very excited to be you know, back in the back lounge uh, group and sort of back in my own group. It's kind of a merging of these two online communities. So Su Susie's um, mm. back lounge back lounge group is for uh, touring professionals, and and my um, just play community is um, for professional musicians and aspiring professional musicians. Um, and I I was just so excited by the idea of having a conversation with this gentleman um, in, in the company of these people because, um, and, and having a, a wider discussion as well, because um, you know, the background to the idea of, the, of, of this kind of conversation was that, you know, I um, had done a, a bits and pieces of professional development, um, of personal, sorry, personal development over the years, and then stumbled across this thing that someone told me was called the three principles and um, when I understood and discussed it with um, the person that sort of introduced it to me, I was shocked that no one had really sort of told me about this before. Um, and uh, one of the people that I met along the way was, was Dr. Dickin Bettinger. And I had a, um, a coaching experience with um, Dr. Dickin as part of um, Jamie Smart's um, Clarity uh, uh, Practitioner training. Um, and um, although I've only ever sort of read and uh, heard uh, talks by Sid Banks um, Sort of after his passing, um, Dickin studied with um, Sid and, and knew Sid very well, um, and and has a background in, in psychology. So I, I'm very excited to um, to to introduce you to Dr. Dickin Bettinger. Um, so welcome. It's a real pleasure of mine to be speaking with you. Thanks, Nick. It is delightful to be here with everybody. It's just. I always love when I do webinars, I do probably about three a week. And I, I just love how Zoom allows us to have a gathering where we can sit face to face, most often in our living room or our gardens or maybe our office and, and have a real conversation. But I, so I love seeing, seeing the faces of people that are here. Thank you for, thank you for joining us. It's, that's great. So um, could you tell us um, to start with a, a little bit of background about how you came to meet Sydney Banks and uh, oh. I guess what 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 that meeting uh, has done for you? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that's a huge uh, question to <laughs> ask you. No, I'd love to talk about that. I'd love to talk about that. <laughs> Uh, I actually started my career teaching, teaching high school, high school English. I loved sharing things with people and watching people have insights and learn. And I love kids. And so I was teaching in a, in a big public high school. And uh, because I love kids, I didn't see any of the kids in my classes as problem kids or as troublemakers. I just saw everybody as equal. We were all just trying to learn. And some people seem to have an easier time of learning than others, but uh, my heart went out to anybody who was having some difficulty in learning. So uh, I found out if you just be really kind and patient and loving, that people settle down. And when people settle down, they, everybody's built to have insights. So I started seeing the value of a quiet mind. Also, I was really into meditating. I don't know, I just, you know, we can all get so busy minded in, in our lives to have time to just sit and allow all of that to settle out. I always just 
started feeling a greater intimacy with life when my mind got quiet. And so I saw the benefit of being really lighthearted and loving and kind to people in a learning situation because they quiet down and then we're built to have new thinking. And I was young, I was 22 years old when I started teaching and I looked 16 and I was teaching 17, 16, 17, 18 year olds. So like on parents night, the parents would not believe I was a teacher. They thought I was a student playing a prank, standing up in front of the class saying, I'm your student's teacher. <laughs> but I fell in love with learning. And that's very, I think, important in terms of our conversation tonight, Nick, and seeing people as having the capacity to have insight and grow and change and learn, and it's built into us. And because I was young, I had so many kids coming and wanting to talk to me about their problems. And pretty soon I was talking to more kids than the guidance counselors in the high school. And the head of the guidance counselors came and said, what, what are you doing? You're taking over our job. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't know, kids just keep coming. And, and, and I had done an, a, a lot of studying about communication. So I was teaching them what I had learned about communicating. And it was helping, helping them with their parents or with their friends or just to get along better. But some kids were coming to tell me about horrible things that they were going through, abuse and trauma. And I felt a little over my head. So I went and got my master's in education and counseling psychology. And then later I went back again and got my doctorate at a university that trained people to be psychologists in the education department. And I love the educational philosophy that if anybody is struggling with anxiety, depression, upset, difficulties psychologically, they don't have an illness. They're nothing wrong with that person fundamentally that they're having difficulty. They just haven't learned yet what they need to learn in order to have an easier time of things. And insight helps us have an easier time with anything. Yeah, you can say now. Thank you. Oh, someone's on. Yeah, Laura, Laura popped in. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I played in the school band. It was like there was just a little cymbal crash there. <laughs> 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 and uh, so that's how I got started as a psychology. And in the education department, they had this very we're all the same, we're all students. We're all here to continue our education in life. And sometimes we have difficulty and there's things we can learn that will make that difficulty easier. So uh, I'm an eternal student more than a teacher because I continue to learn as much as the people I talk to. So as a psychologist, I was always interested in well-being. That was the focus of my career, psychological well-being. Because as a kid, I had experiences of being out in nature. We were talking about that with Susie earlier, being out in nature and my mind would get really quiet. And boy, I had no self-consciousness. I fell in love with nature. I fell in love with my friends that I was playing with in the woods that just was natural is just, it just seemed like in nature, my true self came forward and I wasn't this awkward, shy, anxious, insecure person when I was in nature. And yet when I was in school or around people, I would become very awkward and anxious, insecure. So in part, 
I became a psychologist to learn more about that for myself mm. as well as the people I was working with. Okay. I, and I could see that in nature and from meditating, you know, by the time I met Sydney Banks, I was meditating four hours a day because I saw so much benefit and value, but it seemed to require a lot of hard work to develop and have and maintain a quiet mind. And I would still get anxious. Doesn't and sound that so, quiet. Yeah. So I had been a psychologist for 10 years. I loved it. I loved working with people, talking with them, helping. We were all in this adventure to learn more about life so it would be a little easier, right? So anything could be a little easier. And I had opportunity to work in big businesses and corporations all over the US teaching leadership programs that, and people in companies began to see if you can help the people in our company have, be more present and have a quieter mind they communicate better, they make better decisions. In other words, when people feel better, they do better, no matter what. Performance goes up exponentially, and it could be measured by research that if we did trainings that help people understand better how their mind works so that they could, so that they could live with more presence and more quiet, they would do better in every, reg every regard. And a lot of the problems that come up in any group or in business, the stress, the upsets, the interpersonal conflicts, the struggling over major decisions, the teamwork, all of that improved as people had more well being. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. You didn't have to solve the problem. You had to help people have more well-being and the problems got solved. People would become more creative. People with their job satisfaction would always, always go up. So I got really intrigued by this um, phenomenon. And so after 10 years, I, I met this man who wasn't in the field of psychology. I came across him by reading a book and then going to a training. And then the people in the training talked about this man, Sidney Banks. He was from Scotland. He, had, he grew up very poor, had a difficult childhood, was adopted at birth, had a difficult upbringing. Today, we would probably call, he grew up in a dysfunctional family, right? or basically a family that wasn't having fun. And uh, he became a welder. He moved to Canada and was working as a welder. And he uh, something very, very rare happened to this man. He was at a couple's retreat that his wife dragged him to, to try and improve their relationship. And it was in the early seventies and they were doing a lot of cathartic yelling and screaming and get trying to get your feelings out. And he was very shy and introverted and quiet and had been through an awful lot of pain. And this just seemed to be too painful to do. It was sort of psychology had a philosophy of no pain, no gain. And so he was going to leave. And somebody said to him, Sid, you don't seem to be getting much out of this workshop with this famous psychologist from New York City. What's the problem? And he says, I'm too insecure. It's too painful. It just isn't my cup of tea. And the guy was trying to encourage him and said, Sid, you're not insecure. You just think you are. And he had a 
powerful insight. What he heard was that every bit of his insecurity and, and unhappiness, every bit of it was a temporary thought creation. You just think you are. He saw the fact that we experience whatever we're thinking. And insecurity does not come from our circumstance or situations or from our past or from our personalities or from our parents or from our biochemistry. It's just quite simply the thinking we have in our head at that moment is creating whatever we're feeling. And he said it was like an explosion going off in his head and 40 years of unhappiness just lifted. And for three days and three nights, he couldn't sleep he was so filled with insight and well-being we might and call it an enlightenment experience well this was before this enlightenment experience. <laughs> it was it it was something i hope every human being in the world has what he saw was very very profound realization of where feelings and experience come from. They're created in the moment via thought. And yet if you ask people, and I've traveled the world and I've, and I've asked tens of thousands of people, <laughs> what are you feeling? And where do you think what you're feeling comes from? And it doesn't matter how people answer the first question, what are you feeling? Because we all have a wide range of feelings. That's normal. But our understanding of where that feeling comes from makes a huge difference in our lives. And most people, if you ask, like, for example, if someone says, I'm, I'm tense or I'm stressed or I'm upset, or, and you ask them, well, where do you think those feelings come from? They'll point towards something in the world that they think is causing them to feel that way performance, anxiety. I'm anxious because of this performance. I'm stressed because of people are watching me. I'm upset because of what somebody said to me. And innocently, innocently, and this has been a misunderstanding for hundreds of years, people attribute their feelings to something in their life other than thought because they just haven't been taught. Now, now this is being taught in schools all over the world and the kids and, and people are starting to learn and better understand where their experience comes from. Now, he, that insight helped him look at people with compassion because he could see people innocently getting caught up in thinking that created their anxiety or their upset. And they were innocent because they hadn't learned yet. They hadn't insightfully learned yet the true source of feelings. Not there, nothing wrong. It's just, they just haven't learned where feelings and experience really comes from. Now it's scientific. Now we have all kinds of research that shows whatever we think we feel, no matter what's going on around us, it has our feelings don't really have anything to do with what's going on around us. They have everything to do with what we're thinking in that moment. If we have stress in our thinking, we have stress in our experience. If it's not in our thinking, we can be in the most stressful experience in the world and not experience stress. You put 10 people in the same situation, I guarantee you're going to have 10 different experiences. <laughs> and none of them are determined by the circumstance. They're determined by how people are thinking at that moment. It's not wrong or bad, it's just how we work. Thank God we can have feelings and thought is a gift that allows us to experience life. And then said, had another experience that some people would call a spontaneous enlightenment. He was just talking to his wife and mother-in-law and he looked out the window and I don't know if any of you have read about near death experiences, 
But when I first heard Sid talk about this experience, and I've heard other spiritual teachers talk about their experiences, he described it, it sounded like a near-death experience. It suddenly there was this buzzing field of white light in front of him. Some people describe it as a tunnel. He got drawn into it. His whole thinking mind fell away. And he experienced a more profound sense of our connection and our oneness with all of life and feelings of love like he's never experienced before. We said, Sid, did you have a near-death experience? Lots of people around the world have had those, and they come back and it changes their life, and they feel more loving and compassionate and connected and less anxious and have more well-being. And is that it? And he said, well, it was like I died because I went all the way through that light to the other side and he said it only took about four seconds in real time but when he came out of that experience now here you have to understand here's this guy with a ninth grade education and he's a welder and he goes back to work on monday after having this experience <laughs> and everything for him has changed everything and after a couple of weeks, he just insightfully realizes I need to share what I've learned with other people because I'm convinced anybody can have glimpses of what I had glimpses of and it will bring more well-being into their lives. So he left work with no idea what he would do or he, had, he didn't read, so he had no background in spiritual awakening or psychological awakening. He had no background in that, no understanding of that, really. He just knew what happened to him changed how he saw life, and it gave him hope for people, for all people. He saw there, he saw people already have perfect well-being inside. It only gets covered over by our thinking. And when we go beyond our personal thinking and our minds quiet down, we experience the same benefits that, of enlightenment, uh, feelings that uplift, new and fresh thinking. Listen, my wife is an artist. And with this understanding, she knows when she goes into her studio that if her mind is busy, it's going to reflect in her art. And so she allows her mind to get quiet before she starts painting. No technique. Once you know it's there, you just relax into yourself. And her, her process is... We drive around the car and, and she stops the car all the time. Bless her heart. You know, it takes a long time to go anywhere with my wife because she sees beauty <laughs> everywhere. Because when your mind is quiet, you see beauty everywhere. Mm -hmm. And she stops the car and she sees something. You go, oh my God. And she takes pictures of it. She comes home and she gets the pictures up around her easel and she gets quiet. And I say, Koizy, what are you doing? It's my wife's name, Koizy. What are, you, what are you doing? She says, I want to have the same feeling that I had when I saw that thing that I felt was so beautiful. And when I'm in that feeling, if I paint from that feeling, it's going to show up in my art. It's going to show up. The state of mind we're in when we perform shows up in our performance. Now, wouldn't you know, my wife, her whole life has been a singer and has been in choral groups. And she's had the fortune to sing twice in Carnegie Hall and sang with the Pittsburgh Symphony. And she sang for Parliament in Canada and in New York City and in St. Paul's Cathedral, St. Peter's Cathedral in New York. I mean, in, in Rome. And 
the same thing that with what she learned from our studying with Sid Banks, she sees the role of thought clear enough that tension and anxiety is a gift to awaken us to the present moment, not a statement about the performance or what's happening around us. Mm -hmm. And in that quiet, here's what happens to anybody when our personal thinking gets quiet, our senses come alive. That's where enjoyment, that's why some performers, if they get too caught up in their thinking, they'll say, I don't enjoy doing this anymore. I don't know, I used to love it, but I don't know, now I don't enjoy it. Well, that's what happens. It just means we've, we've gotten out of balance. We're, we're overthinking, over, overthinking. And she says, when she falls out of this, she wells up sometimes with tears because the music is so beautiful. If you go for a walk in the woods and you're thinking, you won't experience beauty. You go for a walk in the woods and your mind gets quiet, you'll be going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, awe. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> awe and wonder are what happens when our senses come alive. Work with someone who's clinically depressed when they see the role of thought and begin to drop out of the thinking that creates those feelings they get their resilience comes back, they come up and they, and people will say, oh my God, the colors, I just didn't know there were such beautiful colors everywhere. I've been missing color. Senses come alive. You eat a meal and you're so busy thinking and talking, you won't taste the food. Your mind gets quiet. Oh my God, every little bite is like the mm -hmm. best taste you've ever had. Now, that's one thing that happens. This beauty, gratitude, and appreciation, thanksgiving. She is so grateful to have an opportunity to sing. She just can't wait for the ne next opportunity. And then something else always happens for human beings when their minds get quiet, their senses come alive, their ability to enjoy life comes alive. The second thing that comes live is as we fall further away from concepts and ideas about ourselves, about our, what we're doing, about our music, about our art, about our work, as we fall further away from that, that's what happened in Sid's Enlightenment, we experience deep beauty and we also experience a greater connection to life. Where, which is why sometimes we're going for a walk in the woods and we fall in love with a tree or a flower. We feel this oneness, this unity. Why is that? Because in truth, we are just energy, in a field of energy and we're all connected, we're all one in truth. It's what all the scientists and physicists are saying these days, there's only one field of energy that dances in and out of form, quantum physics. And what happens then, we feel greater connection. So she feels such a connection with the people she's singing with. And I'm sure any of you have been doing music, you've had these experiences. And it's what allows you to have a passion and love for music and what you do and for performing. And yet, when we have difficulty, we just start getting caught up in thinking in a way that it keeps generating an anxiety or an upset that covers over that natural presence and then enjoyment and then connection. So even in my relationship with my wife, if I get too caught up in my thinking, it's easy then to feel dissatisfied in my relationship 
and knowing that that feeling comes from me and not from our relationship has been life-saving. And with my kids, life-saving. With my grandkids, life-saving is like, if I don't feel close to them, it's in my thinking. It's not in my relationship. And dropping out of that thinking, what happens? I go from my head, metaphorically, into my heart. And for no reason, I start feeling closer to my wife or to my kids or my grandkids. And it's the best thing I've ever learned. It was like parenting just went from seeming like it's a struggle to raise an adolescent to, oh, my God, if I just fall out of my head just for moments, I have these deeper feelings of aliveness and appreciation and, and, and love. I fall in love, fall fall in love with life again and over and over and over again. <laughs> it's 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 wonderful to hear you talking about it and i can i you know what you said about everybody being able to relate to that kind of experience where we do fall out of of our personal thinking everybody it, everybody it, i can see so it true. yeah and i i i can imagine um you know, because when, when when you when you said about um, it being a lifesaver with relationships, I was thinking, yeah, it is when I see it, and then when I when I when I don't see it in, in a particular moment, it's like how I, the the temptation, I guess, I've heard clients say, or that I've felt sometimes when I've gone to a coach, um, has been, well, how, how what do I have to do to quieten my mind, or what, like like you said about all the yeah. of effort and the doing, and um, you know, because you know, in my case, I was certainly you know qu quite proud of my ability to be really sinky and um up in yeah. my head it kind of became a bit of a badge of honor to be so um uh effortful in my thinking yeah. you know when i discovered when i first was introduced to this understanding it was a, it felt like a real u-turn it felt like I'd, I, a lot of the value i'd placed on my ability to to think personally was actually it felt strange to let go of that noise in my head even though it, yeah. it did also feel better yeah what would you say to somebody that you know would say like well how do i what do i have to do to quiet my mind how can i how do i have to think what's the right way to think yeah it's a it, it's a question i get all the time and before i met sid bangs i read all these books where in the last chapter they'd give you the seven steps to deal with your anxiety the 14 things you can do the techniques you can try and i was a technique junkie and i did constantly i was working on myself constantly as a way of trying to bring more well-being so the first thing that's helpful for people to realize that we're human beings, not human doings. And that we already have all the well-being we need inside. That any human being on this planet, when their mind quiets down, become more present, more friendly, more enjoy, enjoy life more, more creative more alive, no exception. I've seen no exception to that. And I've worked with people in prison. I've worked with people who have spent their whole life in mental institutions. And they're just, all human beings think, all human beings are aware, and all human beings are connected to a deeper intelligence. Right? Some people call it wisdom. So like, I have a friend who's a professional drummer. And he says, sometimes when I'm playing Dickin, my mind gets so quiet that it feels like the guy who's overthinking what I'm doing just disappears and another guy shows up. <laughs> right? We all cherish those moments where it feels like it's just effortless that what we're doing or in a performance or in, in singing or playing music where it feels like we just are at the top of our game. In sports, they call that being in the zone. So it, it helps, Nick, for people to understand you already have the capacity 
to be at your best. You don't develop it, you uncover it. And it's only our thinking. So most adults that I notice when they feel tension, stress, or upset, do more thinking rather than wake up out of that thinking going, oh yeah, it's just some thoughts in the moment. If I let them go, they flow, they dissipate, they disappear. If I keep thinking them, I keep creating that feeling. So it's very helpful to know you already have what you're looking for. If you understand that your feelings are created from thought in the moment, you'll catch yourself thinking. And time and again, no technique. You'll just let it go and come back to the now. It's like when you put your hand on a hot stove, once you know that the pain comes from having your hand on the stove, is from having your hand on a hot stove, you don't say, well, what, how do I take my hand off the hot stove? No one asks that. This happens. This is what I see with all of my clients. The instant they see that this tension is created from their own thinking, they take their hands off their thinking. As Sid, as Sid Banks would teach, you let go of everything you're thinking. You, you go beyond all concepts, you temporarily close your laptop because you're not going to find enjoyment and wisdom in your intellect, in your computer mind. Now, there's nothing wrong. I want to make very clear. The intellect's a beautiful thing. It's our capacity to think conceptually and intellectually. It's beautiful. What a gift. And because it's a tool, though, it can be used very unwisely can be used wisely or wisely. How do we know when we're using wisely? When we think about something, it's helpful. And as soon as we're thinking about something in a way that creates tension, stress, or upset, we're, we're trying to use our intellect in a way it wasn't designed and we're getting out of balance with this deeper intelligence with wisdom. And when there's not a balance between intellect and wisdom, we lose enjoyment. We get stuck in feelings of anxiety and tension and stress. We try to think our way out of it, which is an impossibility. So it's more having insight into how this works that helps people than trying hard not to think or trying hard not. Trying is always thinking that creates stress. And when you see that, you let go of everything you're thinking, you'll find out you'll find what you're looking for. Right. you'll come home that's the name of my book coming home it's coming we get a little lost up here in our thinking then we wake up and come home again can can i give an example nick absolutely i'm pretty sure it was it's it's a perlman i could be wrong because it was a long time ago i saw mm -hmm. this on a on a video he was doing a master class for a bunch of young violinist protégés and he's so sensitive to if people get too caught up in their heads. I mean, even if you watch shows like The Voice or American Idol, they'll always say to the singers, you're thinking too much. You got to relax and just be yourself. And, you know, it, it's common knowledge now or it's, it, it's become in sports and in performance. You know, if you get too caught up in your head, your performance suffers immediately and it's not authentic. And, and so it's like Perlman saw this incredible young protege violinist playing. And, he, and it sounded like she had memorized the notes and was just trying to remember what to play. You know how that it sounded mm -hmm. perfect, mm -hmm. perfect technically, but there was no feeling, no passion, no juice in it. So he said to her, instead of playing this piece, I want you to sing it to me. And you could see her drop out of her thinking and she sang with so much feeling. And he goes, yes, 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 that's it, that's it. Now, play as if you're singing the music. 
<laughs> it was a completely different piece, completely different piece. The other woman showed up <laughs> metaphorically. Mm. Isn't that something? I, I, I still, I get chills just thinking about it because all of us have that capacity if we begin to trust this deeper intelligence. Sure, learn, study, remember, get information, but we can't live there when we perform. And when we fall out of our thinking, this deeper wisdom knows how to utilize what we have stored in our intellect. And you have a perfect balance. We're in harmony. We're, we're letting the music play through us. It feels like we're part of something greater and bigger that's playing through us or singing our group. Mm. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Absolutely. So, 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 I'm I'm imagining how I would have heard you um, a few years ago, and I would have thought, oh, that's a really good technique. Get the student to sing, you know, and that's that's how it's going to, um, yeah. uh, you know, un unlock it. And, and that's not what I'm hearing and what you're saying now. I'm, I'm hearing that you know, in in the same way that. Um, that you know, Sid's work is referred to as as principles in, in, in as um, under as an underlying truth of how the whole system's working. That that um, yeah, he called the, he called these facts not beliefs. Mm. The principles are the fundamental ways that the energy of life itself works. The, the greatest the, the greatest principle is that out of this field of formless energy, life is created. That's the greatest mystery. And that's the greatest truth. The scientists at NASA put out a research recently and they said, if you take everything in the universe that can be seen with any kind of instrumentation, whether the largest telescopes or the most refined microscopes. In other words, you take everything in the world that has form, matter, and you measure the energy of everything that has form, it only makes up 4% of the universe. <laughs> they say 96% of the universe is formless formless energy. And the great mystery is everything that has form came from that energy. Now, Sid Banks realized that experientially. He went beyond the form of body and mind and experienced his connection with the nature of life. And he says, there are three fundamental characteristics of the energy of life. It's creative. When I hear someone say, I'm not creative, to me, it's a joke. Every moment of their existence is being created. There's something beating our heart, running our pancreas, bringing us perceptions, allowing us to have sensory experience. It's a miracle, it's a gift as being created from this energy. So it's creative. That's the principle of thought. It's aware. Everything in the universe is created from this field of awareness. So everything has awareness. So fortunately, we can become aware of the fact that we think. Not what we're thinking, but just the fact that I'm thinking and then having experience. That's how life works. It's created from the inside out. And the universe, so creative, aware, and then wise. This deeper energy of life has an intelligence to it that knows how to create and operate what's created, which is why when people's minds get quiet, they have more common sense, more clarity, more intuition. They just seem to know what to do in difficult circumstance. 
You can see evidence of that everywhere when you look for it. They say to somebody in a life and death situation, in case of an emergency, they say, stay calm. They never say, think yourself into a frenzy. They say, stay calm. Why is that? Because then intuitively, you, you'll have the best chance possible of surviving and thriving. You'll know what to do without thinking about it. You'll play well without thinking about it. Tiger Woods says golf is a 98% mental game by the time you're a professional. Because we're all at the same skill level, but that magic, that ability to, in a sense, perform beyond what you think possible is available to everybody if we're open to it. I'm, I'm, mind rather than I'm, really, I'm really curious about, um, sorry to jump in, I, I'm really curious about um, uh, how this understanding kind of collided or, or didn't collide or, or meshed with your prior psychological training. Like, <laughs> have, was that how, how uncomfortable um, a meeting was, was that? <laughs> Because I'm hearing well, people, because I, I can imagine people thinking, okay, well, this is a bit like uh, meditation, or this is a bit like neuroscience, or something that I read. But but the way that I hear is that this is very, this is a very, very fundamentally different um, yeah, it's, understanding, it's a, it's a different paradigm altogether, mm. and, and it's more scientific and accurate. It's not true that the world makes us anxious. There's no science. There have been 600 research studies that have shown that's not even true that circumstance doesn't determine our experience because like I said, you put a hundred people in the worst situation you can imagine, whether it's a concentration camp or whether it's be being in the twin towers when the building is falling down around you, or it's being in a, in a tornado that devastates your neighborhood. Everybody has a different experience and it's not determined by circumstance. It's, determined completely by what we end up thinking at that moment. So you might have fear and be paralyzed. You might have complete presence and calm as often happens to people in adverse situations, or you might have enormous selfless compassion and love and do things that in a sense, put your own life at risk to help other people. Right? Well-being is built into us. And when people become calm, they become more of service, more kind, more loving to the people around them. So all people think that's not a technique. That's not, it's a fact. It's like the, the Principles, what we call the principles are that which is most fundamental in life, the, the creative forces of life. Right? It's a fact that people think. It's a fact that people are aware. It's a fact that people have a mind that's an intelligence far greater than just their intellect. I can go anywhere in the world and talk about those facts and people don't argue with me. Nobody says, no, I don't think. Nobody says, no, I don't have awareness. Nobody says, no, I don't have a mind. Universal facts, psychology. This is so different than my psychology because when I was a psychologist, I started way back in the 70s, early 70s, there were like three different cognitive theories. There were like 10 different existential humanistic theories. There were all these behavioral theories and every psychologist had a different theoretical basis. Well, theories are best guesses. They're not principles. Psychology has not had theories. William James, the father of American psychology said if, if principles were ever discovered in psychology, it would be a breakthrough greater than the discovery of fire. It would be monumental. 
because there was just a theoretical basis, Sid Banks discovered universal fundamental principles that can explain every moment of human experience and behavior. We are experiencing what we're thinking. Whether even when I work with people who have been diagnosed as psychotic, they're just living in some fearful thinking and they don't know it. They don't know it's thought. And when they know it's thought, it's not so scary because now it's not, I'm damaged goods. There's something wrong with me or the Martians are taking over my mind. It's I'm a thinker like everybody else and I'm feeling my thinking like everybody else. That's Sid's first insight. Every bit of our experience is created from the power of thought. It relieves people of a lot of thinking. I probably, the first training I went to in this, I was a big time worrier. In other words, I did a lot of thinking about things that hadn't happened and I got really anxious about it. And after understanding this, just my first insight probably, I, I'd catch myself starting to worry and I'd worry for five minutes instead of an hour. Do you, do you know mm -hmm. what that does to the quality <laughs> of life? I teach this to little kids and to watch kids that are like one 10 year old girl from England was so anxious. Her, the, the teachers in school said, I don't know if she can be in a, in a school, I think she should be in a school for emotionally disturbed kids. And her mom got in touch with me and I had three half hour sessions with her. And you know what, after the first session, you know, she told her mom, she goes, mom, mom, the next morning at breakfast, mom, mom, everybody has a thought factory inside of themselves and it's making thoughts all day long. And that's where our feelings come from. She's 10 years old. I didn't talk to her about a thought factory. That was her insight. She saw, as anyone can do, oh my gosh, I'm living in the feeling of my thinking. And we all are. And it works that way for everybody. It's a fact. Scientific. It's really scientific. Whatever we think we're going to feel, if, you, if you're thinking sad, that's okay. It's nothing wrong with feeling sad. But when your thinking changes, your friend comes to the door and you go, oh, hi, good to see you. Your thinking changes, you feel different. It's like a movie. When the film changes, you get something different on the screen. That's how we work. And so here's this 10-year-old girl realizes that. You know what happened the next time we got together? Of course, we spent most of our time talking about her, her, her favorite thing, which is unicorns. So we talked about a unicorn for a long time. I learned so much about unicorns, you know. Did you know when you touch the horn, colorful butterflies fly out? I didn't know that, you know. I didn't so know that either. <laughs> she, she became my teacher about unicorns. And, and, and I would plant little seeds with her about how what we're feeling right now, all the enjoyment we're having is coming from thought. And same with our anxiety that's coming with thought. Just mention that at the end of a half hour session. Talk to her a little about it. And she started having insights because it made sense. You know why? Because it's true. If it wasn't true, it'd be a hard sell. I'd have to sell. I don't have to sell anything. I remind people of what they know on a deeper level is true. We're always thinking from the moment we're born till we die and we live in a thought created reality. That's true. So I remind people of that, that underneath our thinking is pure consciousness, presence. That's true. We become more awake, more aware when we're present. Our senses come alive. That's true. And when we're open like that, this deeper intelligence brings us new and fresh feeling and thinking that's helpful. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called wisdom. Now, we used to think only certain people were wise. Now we know every single person is connected to this same source of intelligence. 
we're all waves on the ocean of life. And even though we might think I'm a little wave and I'm not as good as that big wave and that big wave is better and has a beautiful curl, I got to take a seminar in that or I got to learn how to get bigger and curl. This teaching, Sid Banks teaching, isn't about self-development. It's about looking down and realizing our true nature. It's going, oh my gosh, I'm as much ocean as anybody else. I'm connected to the same creative, aware, wise life energy as anybody. And that when I get present, my best comes forward and reveals itself naturally. Mm. We start living more and more in the now. I could, I could speak to you for hours and hours, and I'm conscious that there are people on this call that would love to ask you questions um, from what's come up. So mm. are you happy to take some, some questions? Oh, I'd love to. I, this is perfect time, and we told people we'd leave a good chunk of time at the end. So I'd love to talk to anybody who either has comments, if you're hearing something that resonates and is making sense to you, I'd love to hear that, or if you have questions. Any questions? You just want to un unmute yourself or put your oh Susie's got Susie's got a hand up. Maybe putting hands up is a good idea actually. Hi Susie. You know me, I've always got a question. No, great. <laughs> Get so stuck in. <laughs> I was I was gonna ask something because it all makes perfect sense. And actually, uh good. Dr. Dickon, you have the most amazing voice and it's oh. trance like just listening to you mm. um so to use your words when the martians have taken over yeah <laughs> so when you're in the absolute heat of the moment yeah how do you step out of that how do you bring it all down yeah oh i'm glad you asked that susie that's great now listen i still get caught up in my thinking at times and then what I'm feeling, if I don't know it's thought at that moment, I'm pretty sure it does have to do with the Martians or the traffic. The traffic is bumming me out today or the weather is getting to me or the amount of work I have is stressing me out, right? But the more you begin to catch on to this because it's true, you just start seeing it more and more often spontaneously. It just happens. You just start catching yourself and realizing you're a thinker. I'm sitting here thinking about this performance I'm doing in a week and I'm getting all anxious and I'm sitting here on a beautiful day and I'm just sitting here innocently thinking up all this anxiety. And at times you catch yourself and you fall out of that thinking and the anxiety dissipates Every time when we come back to the now, when we're resting in the now, those kind of feelings dissipate as that thinking falls away. I was doing a training for a company in Alaska and I went into a gift shop, saw these snow globes and I went, oh my God, that would be perfect metaphor. And I go into the, this team and these people would get all busy-minded as like shaking the snow globe and then wonder why they had difficulty with each other. And when we realize it's thought, it's like we temporarily just set our thinking down and the, it's built for the mind to clear. We gain greater clarity because that's our natural state. Now we're present. Now we're open. Now we're free to let any thought and feeling that comes our way to flow through us. So even when we get anxious and upset, if it's flowing through us, we're still present and can perform well. It's not like we have to hold on to a certain feeling. It's when we're wide open and in this flow, we're in our well being. Like, look at little babies. They're fully present. I love holding my grandkids when they're babies and 
And I learned so much from them about being fully present and letting all thoughts and feelings flow through and they'd laugh and cry and be excited and have all kinds of experience, but they didn't think into any of it. So they didn't get stuck in any of it. So at times we'll get stuck, but here's, Susie, maybe this is another way of answering this. Once you understand your feelings come from thought, your relationship to stress and anxiety and upset changes. It becomes helpful, biofeedback, letting you know the only problem is not out there in the world, it's you caught in thought. And that's the only problem. And when that falls away, you feel different, you see different, you have clarity, you have feelings that uplift, you get new and fresh creative thought. So pretty soon, Susie, your feelings will all day long be reminding you that you're a thinker and you'll be grateful for tension, stress, upset. Uh, they're like an alarm clock going off to wake us back up to the now. Once you understand the nature of thought and feeling, feelings become friendly and helpful rather than, I used to curse feeling stressed and think there was something wrong and try hard to get rid of it. And now understanding it allows it to just come and go naturally because I still get stressed and upset. And, but boy, is it nice when I'm like a baby in terms of it. In Tibetan Buddhism, they call our natural state newborn consciousness. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, wa I love watching people who are so gripped by their thinking and very serious lighten up and be able to laugh and enjoy life again. And they become like inside that innocence and that lightheartedness, which is our natural state, comes back to people. Their love of what they're doing. Something that you used to dread, you begin to enjoy. Thank you. I love the snow globe analogy. Oh, yeah. I think that's a, that's a really useful one when you suddenly yeah, realize is. you're in that. You can see when people are thinking, it's like they're shaking the globe and then wonder why they don't have clarity. Right? That's because this is one of the things Sid Banks used to say to us all the time. You can't think your way to well-being. You can't analyze your way to clarity. You can't analyze your way to love and understanding. If I don't feel loving toward my wife, analyzing, which I used to do for hours, doesn't bring me closer. It's when I fall out of my thinking, the love that's already here, I fall into love, right? I fall into love and then I see a different wife. She looks different. <laughs> She looks different. Okay. We jump up a level of consciousness and at each level, things look different. So the world literally changes in front of us as our minds change. I can see um, uh, Rich has got his hand up and so has Michaela, so go to Rich first. Hi, Dickon. Richard. <laughs> Hello, my friend. Pleasure. I was, wasn't going to miss this one. Um, oh, man. I've always enjoyed listening to you share, um, you know, your wisdom and, you know, the learnings and the lessons and everything else. There's a couple of things resonated with me, what you, how you were describing Koizu when she gets creative. And I, I can totally relate to that because, like, my design work, same thing, is I often will look at the work that comes out and I go, where did that come from? Where, that's right. There you go. The good thing is, is when you go, I know where it came from. Yeah. And uh, it's not the intellectual ego you that says, I know. It's just the idea of uncovering something that already exists. And Beautiful. it's like music. Um, Beautiful. I was given a, a, a scale book by my grandsons for bass, <laughs> which was good. 
But what was cool about the whole thing is that when I'd start analyzing it in my head while I was playing, I'd, I'd screw up as opposed to just forgetting about it and just playing and, yeah. and just drawing from that inner source that was there. And, and that's sort of the essence of performance is like, what is jamming? But that precisely where there is no thought about what you're going to bring out. Yeah. And, uh, there was one experience that um, I was called upon in an impromptu moment bass solo <laughs> and whoa, you know well that's your mind going ah, guy, i don't know if i can do this but it was unbelievable because like my mind was trying to keep up with what was being played and at the end of the evening people came up to me and said wow i didn't know you could play like that and neither did i was the thing yeah, <laughs> yeah. so anyways it's cool when like you say you, you step away from your intellectual thought patterns and everything else and just rest into that that's what that's when in performance there's ease and there's almost a sense of grace isn't there richard where you just find yourself inexplicably doing things that you hadn't done before or bring bringing a feeling to what you're doing that is tangible you can tell when people are playing from that space. You can tell when people are singing from that space. It connects on a deeper level. That's, that's a great story, Richard. Thanks for share, sharing that. I'm sure everybody has stories like this where it seemed like by grace you fell out of your thinking and then things just seem to go smoother, easier, beyond what you thought you were capable of. Uh, it's built into us for that, which is beautiful. Awesome. Michaela. Hi. <laughs> um, so, hi. <laughs> hi. I love this. Uh, and it's something I'm really trying to sort of learn and, and take in to, for myself. <laughs> um, obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. But I'm interested to know, like, what suggestions do you have for sort of helping someone, such as a partner or a friend or someone uh, or anyone else who you see sort of doesn't accept this kind of mindset and still thinks that things are stressful and it's stressful and you know and it they they don't see that they're stressed because of their reaction to things they, they still place it on the external how do you kind of help someone in a moment or just you know maybe come round to a mindset without obviously annoying them that you know <laughs> you're trying to preach to them or anything that you know yeah. they, they haven't got it's it a, yet <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a slippery slope because in our relationships <laughs> the person that we're with has not signed a contract that you can correct them or even teach them you know we sign up to love and forgive and 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 then anything over and above that is slippery slope but that's a really good question i mean when i first learned this i was so excited by the fact that i started seeing Quite simply, I just started seeing the fact that I was a thinker and that's where my feelings were coming from. I, I kept sort of catching myself caught up in thought a lot and it fell away naturally without a technique. And then I would be more present. And then I saw my moods would come and go more gracefully. And then I started seeing that when I was feeling good, I had all kinds of common sense. So in one sense, I could answer your question by saying, when your mind falls away and you're in that feeling of just presence and you're totally in love with your, if something occurs to you at that moment to say to the person you're with, it's going to come from the best feeling. And people can tell if you're anxious or nervous trying to share something with them and they're more likely to hear it as preaching or criticism. Now, the other thing I can say about this from seeing hundreds and hundreds of people wanting 
to, to help the people they're closest to have more well-being. It rarely works to walk up to somebody who's caught up in their thinking and saying, you're just thinking. <laughs> oh my God, I did that with both my kids for a couple of weeks after I learned this. And at the end of two weeks, my daughter who was 14 and my son who was eight or nine came up to me together. And my daughter says, dad, Ben and I have been talking. <laughs> it's like she was the union rep, you know. Ben and I have been talking, and we've decided if you say one more word to us about thought or moods, we're going to run away. Right? And she was feisty and, and yeah, would have, yeah. you know. So, uh, what I had to learn, what I learned from that, though, is if I want to help the people around, them first of all like on an airplane put your own yeah, oxygen you know, I, I mask on first states, put it put it on first you know, until that happens you find I, your well-being yeah. and you will come to the person you'll come to the person with presence and kindness well, like, and that helps. Ring, that's what helps I don't want to go back to the state. That's so what I'm helps sure. the people in yeah, our no one's family. Calling. Then there's you no work, live and then there's well no money, being, and, then... and then it'll affect the people. And, and over time, you'll see them changing. And they'll be very interested. that in, <laughs> They'll start saying, I want what she's got. You know, it's like, what's your secret? <laughs> what dope are you smoking? You know, it's like, yeah. Or you can just ask your partner permission and say, listen, I've learned some things. Can I share with you what I, I've learned? Rather than let me tell you what your problem is. Say, here's what I've been learning. And you share that. And it's very natural. People don't tend to get upset and reactive when you talk about insights you've been having that are helping you. So those are just some ideas, Michaelia. I hope I hope they're helpful to you. Live it yourself. And then out of that, it'll just be natural. That's what I found with my kids. After six months of living this with my kids, they both were begging me to share with them what I was learning because they saw me change. They saw me getting less reactive, more lighthearted, get over things quicker. They saw me more consistently bringing good feeling to them rather than my upset and reactivity. And I'm loving the heck out of life and being a parent and they could tell. And then, then they were open. Then they were giving me permission to share with them what I was learning. And at that point I would share what I was learning, not trying to get them to be different or change. And they started changing like crazy. They started seeing the simplicity of this. My daughter started, she had a huge insight into thought when she was 14. Huge insight, changed her life. Changed her life. She changed so dramatically. She went from being very emotionally reactive to life, thinking life was making her feel that way, to being like she was 40 years old with poise and confidence. And every single one of our friends, my wife and I, would come up to us and say, oh my God, what's happened to Nina? Her posture, her voice, her confidence, her clarity, her presence, unbelievable. Right. Nina would come home at the end of the day and say, dad, oh my God, all my friends are doing it. And I say, what are you, what? I'm thinking, sex and drugs, you know, it's like, she goes, no, dad, no, dad, come on. All my friends are doing it. They get upset, which is normal, but then they keep thinking about it and talking about it all day long. And it keeps it alive innocently. And they don't know it. They have no clue. It's innocent. And she started having enormous compassion for people who would get caught up even the people she didn't like, she started having compassion for. Oh yeah, they're no different than us, dad. They're thinkers too. 
she became my teacher. She went past my level of understanding with her insight. And so at the end of the day, not only would she ask me about what I was learning, but I'd be asking her. So how did you deal with that situation? And it's like, oh my God, you know, it's like, it just okay. got simple, yeah. That's it. I can someone, see someone else? I can see Krista's got a hand up. Hi, Nick. Hi, Dickon. I, oh, I hi. Just, hi. It's just, this has been a great, great talk and I uh, just sparked an anecdote, actually, what you were just talking about. Um, no, good. It's just a very random moment, like, you know, mm. university days, living with these five guys. And I remember somebody in the household had devised this technique. If people were too stressed or freaking out, they would call it resetting and they would pick you up. They were strong, turn you over and shake you three times and then put you back. <laughs> and it, it was so funny. <laughs> and anyway, it just it just made me think of this, like these kind of funny techniques to get you out of your mind into yeah. your body and, just, and humor and all these things. Anyway, it was just it was funny. A moment. Yeah. It came Krista, that's beautiful. I love that. I'm going to I'm going to use that as like. You know, on computers, you have a reset button, <laughs> you know, or a refresh, refresh the page button. It's, yeah. it's very similar. When we start understanding that our feeling is created from our own thinking, we press the refresh button. We let go of everything we're thinking. We start getting new and fresh thinking. And it does refresh the page. It does shake us up. <laughs> That's the funniest thing. That's so funny. How clever. There were some how, funny dudes. <laughs> how, how clever of that person to come up with that strategy. See, even, even that wisdom brought him a new thought. Oh, wouldn't it be fun to just shake people up and, and let them have a, a, a fresh start? That's so cute. That's clever. <laughs> Thanks, Krista. <laughs> Thanks. Any other... Um insights or questions or observations there's usually someone at this stage who, who would quite secretly like to but thinks that they'll be hogging the, the floor and it's never the case that we always want it it's your turn and it's we're kind of waiting for yeah. what you have to bring it or i've i've really enjoyed um spending time with with everybody today i'd love to yeah, a little more about what, what it sounds like to you guys. Oh, Keris. Oh, oh, good. Oh, I think you're muted still. I am. Hey. Hi, Mick. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> um, right. Okay. Well, I've been working as a coach in the entertainment industry for oh. professionally for about five years. Mm -hmm. And of course, I've done CBT, REBT, you know, all the acronyms. Um, yeah. But I never started by teaching that. I've kind of mutated into that. I think I've probably been coaching most of my life because yeah. it goes back to my dad, who, when I was very uh, a child, he's, you remember him saying, Keris, you're not your thoughts. You are not your feelings. You are so much more than that. You've got to let mm. go of this. Wow. Um, and I was in primary school then. Oh. Um, I, he was very old. So by the time I was in secondary school, he was in his 70s. And I was he was like, I'm going to make sure I put you out into the world, you know, knowing your own mind, being able to stand on your own two feet. So when I started, I became mum to everyone. By the time I was 20, I was a go to person at my ballet school and, you know, um, no. But over the years, you know, even coaching sort of unofficially, then I started coaching professionally. And the amount of pushback I've had that in order to make a living now, I'm actually incorporating back sort of CBT techniques into my coaching, which I think is fine as an illustration of how you can change your mind. But it's not the root of it. Yeah, it's not the root of it. That's yeah. right. So yeah. I'm just trying to find how hard should I push back and go back to the way I used to coach before <laughs> I took, took all my training. <laughs> yeah, in a quiet moment, you'll know. <laughs> you will, you'll know. You'll, you'll know when it's time to change or do something different. Yeah. 
I found that as a psychologist for 10 years, if I introduced a theory, I would get pushback. Mm -hmm. If I introduced a technique, I might get pushback or people say, well, it worked for a while and now it's not working. Mm -hmm. And I've, I saw that over and over and over again. At a certain point, people would say, what other techniques do you have? Mm -hmm. And then it's a constant search for the next thing to do that yeah. somebody else tells you you need to do. And it, like you said, it doesn't, they can help, but it doesn't get to the root of it. Yeah. And changing all of it, it's exhausting. Yeah. You know, and you can't ask people to change their thoughts constantly. It's just tiring. Yeah. And I've always yeah. said, look, you have to, you have to let go. You have to just, you know, give in and, you know, let all of that out. So... Well, well, you know, that's good advice, but even yeah. telling people to let go, you can get pushed back. Yeah. When, I, when I share with people, I'll just tell you how our minds work. Mm. I'm not trying to tell you how to think. I'm not going to tell you what to think. If you ask me for advice, I'll give you advice, but I, I'm not here to do that. I'm here yeah. to explain to you all human beings work the same way. We're always thinking, whatever we're thinking, we're feeling, and either we're aware of that fact or we're not. When we're not, we do a lot of thinking that keeps generating a lot of stress and upset and tension, or that keeps us preoccupied and we're not present, even if it's not stressful. It's just, we're just always thinking. And this is how it works. We think, we can, we're aware beings, and when we realize the fact of thought there's behind our thinking there's this wide open awake mm. space called consciousness mm. that's a fact that's i'm not telling you what to do or how to do it i'm just saying that's there and when we're standing as consciousness or awareness or we are awake new and fresh can come in Mm -hmm. that's the power of mind is it creates new and fresh it creates life that's a fact so mm -hmm. in the purest form i'm not trying to teach somebody something for them to remember i'm reminding them of this is how life works mm -hmm. all human beings think mm -hmm. all human beings are conscious and all human beings are connected to a deeper intelligence. Then people have their own insights. They come up with their own techniques, if you will. They come up with their own ideas. They love dropping into the space where they don't know anything with their intellect, but where they get new and fresh, where creativity is the nature of life. Mm -hmm. Just fall in love with stepping into the unknown over and over again to be nourished, nourished by the soul, nourished by this thing. Now, if at times I give advice, then people can disagree with it. If I tell them what to do, you should be present. Don't think. You do this. Don't do this. Then I can get pushback. But if I say, it's, it's like, Someone you want to teach how to drive a car, you can say, okay, here's how it works, especially if it's a stick shift, but not many <laughs> cars are anymore. When I taught my kids, it was stick shift. I said, okay, gas, brake, clutch, here's how they work. Here's how they work in tandem. I can't tell you how to drive. You'll have to figure it out yourself, play with it, experiment, find out. And then you go, oh, I saw my 15 year old son go, oh, I, I'm getting it, Dan, I'm getting it, I'm getting it, All right? It's the same with true coaching is reminding people of things that are true and then they go, oh, I get it. Mm -hmm. And then they have their own insights, their own common sense coming from this deeper intelligence of how to live their lives. So, less and less do we as therapists or coaches tell people what to do or how to how to live life and just say let me tell you the fundamental nature of how all human beings are mm. and as you learn that you'll be able to navigate your own thinking you'll be able to 
live in deeper feelings of well-being. You'll see the benefit of letting go of judgmental thoughts, which is what forgiveness is. Who, who, who suffers if we hold on to a judgment about, I'm not forgiving them. And if you let it go, who, who benefits? Well, not only you, but everybody. You bring more presence, clarity, mm -hmm. perspective, love. Right? So as, as your understanding deepens, Sharis, your role as a coach changes. Your role yeah. as a coach, rather than giving good advice, you and it, you point toward what's true. Mm. Well, you're having a problem because you're like everybody else. You're always thinking, and at times we get caught up in our thinking, and so you continue to feel that. That's true for me too. That's true mm. for everybody. So you're not telling them what to do. You're saying, this is no wonder you feel the way you do. Mm. This is how it works, right? And here's how this works and here's how this works. And then people settle in because they're not, a lot of people push back when they are told what to do. God, if I told my teenagers what to do, it was like a media pushback. <laughs> They'd say, you want to fight? We're getting good at this. We're getting good at this. We'll beat you at your own game. You know? <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Thank you. Okay, good, good. And you had a very wise father. That's, <laughs> that, that's, really, that's really beautiful. Uh, very wise advice. Great stuff. Awesome. Really, really lovely discussion. So, so we're at time now. So I just want to thank um, not only Dickin, but, but Susie as well for sort of the merging of the group, but, but particular, particular thanks to Dickin for spending time with us and sharing your experiences oh, and wisdom and love and presence. So thank you, sir. No, oh, Nick, you're welcome. You're a good man. Susie, thank you for letting me crash your party. <laughs> it's a great party you throw <laughs> thank you actually both of you a lot of food for thought it's funny i've written loads of notes I hope, i've written them in such a scribble i hope i can read them <laughs> yeah. I, I had one client yeah. leave a session and say that's a lot of food for unthought <laughs> <laughs> let me not think about this for a minute and see what happens <laughs> Just the close, just the close things. If people wanted yeah. to um, reach out to you, Dick, and how, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? And well, if you have enjoyed hearing about these principles, if you if you go to YouTube and Google my name, somebody just told me there's like two hundred talks from all different conferences and webinars and things from, that I've done over time. Uh, uh, so you can listen to other talks there. Um, and if you want to be in touch with me directly, if you have a question or something, uh, my email is my name, dickon.bettinger at gmail.com. Right. I have a website. If you Google my name, you'll get my website too. Three Principles Mentoring. Hmm. Wonderful. Great stuff. Well, thank, thanks once again. And uh, that's where this part of the session's uh, going to finish. Susie, are you, are you, is your crowd continuing their meeting as per usual? Yeah, we'll probably just hang around and check in <laughs> like we normally do, <laughs> which stuff. everyone is is welcome to, <laughs> to stay. No obligation. Hear us winter on. So, but thank you so much, Nick, for inviting this and Dick in. Yeah, really, I need I needed for me personally needed this reset. I really did. Um, uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, I'm looking at all the comments going on. This has had real impact. So massive. Thank I you. I can't get that image out of my mind of turning someone up and down and shaking. <laughs> Human reset. <laughs> Every house needs one. <laughs>
I just did a phrase search for Dick and Bettinger on Google, and you've got seven thousand and fifty results. So you you you'll be you'll find them. <laughs> oh, good lord! Uh, oh, you're, good. You've been out there long enough, Dick, and you're, yeah. you're, you're raising yeah. the you're raising the high tide mark. So, <laughs> uh, thanks, Richard. Well, lovely being with everybody. I hope this has been helpful for folks. And if not, feel free to ignore everything I've said. All righty. Nick, thanks again. Keep in touch, Nick. Yeah, I will do.